the sun shines bright on Caraconti. His first crops of racing age are showing brilliance on the racetrack with a high percentage of stakes winners. His versatility is evidenced by winners on all surfaces across the globe. And his offspring are lighting up the sales ring. With his biggest and best quality of books in the pipeline, the sun shines bright on this value sire. Kara Conti, standing at Gainesway. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Time Form U.S. Road to the Derby series presented by Gainesway, as Gainesway is presenting all of our 2022 Kentucky Derby prep coverage uh, daily racing form. The focus of this week's Time Form U.S. Derby prep is the Sam F. Davis Stakes Grade 3 event at Tampa Bay Downs on Saturday, going a mile and a 16th for the three-year-olds. Let's throw up the field for this race. It's a pretty large group of runners. This is real a real doozy. We've got 13 signed on. 12 will get into the race. Uh, there's one stuck on the also eligible list, the number 13. Uh, but it's a really wide open competitive affair. The number three classic causeway is the lukewarm morning line favorite at three to one. But uh, the morning line, you could see it's really spread around. We've got a five to one shot in howling time, a nine to two shot in make it big, a couple six to one shots, and then a lot of bigger prices. And many of which you can make a decent case for a lot of horses less than a double digits on the morning line i think are not without a chance in this race so there are many contenders that you could possibly discuss i'm not going to go through all of them but i will highlight the ones that i find most intriguing and those that could take money that i think you have to have a take on when you're handicapping this race before we get into the contenders though let's take a look at the time form us pace projector and given the large field some runners stretching out in distance others that have done their best running forwardly placed i think we are going to have a Fast pace, and that's what the time form U.S. pace projector is indicating here with that red flag showing up, indicating a fast pace. Both the number two and the number three do have tactical speed, especially in the case of the number two, Unpredictable Bay, who's coming out of a maiden victory going six furlongs. I'm not going to really talk about him as a contender in this race, but he's run some nice speed figures in his career. He's obviously stretching out in distance off that sprint maiden victory, but he's not an untalented horse who's listed at 20 to 1 on the morning line, so I would not be surprised if he takes them a long way up front, but there should be others jockeying for position outside of him, including that favorite classic Causeway who did go gate to wire in his debut, the number six trademark who has shown a lot of tactical speed in his two route starts. And also do note that number 13, Little Vic, an also eligible runner will not show up on the pace projector. He will show up though after scratch time if there is a scratch within the main body of the field and that AE runner gets into the race, Little Vic will be added to the pace projector. I just note based on his early pace rating he would be shown in front on the pace projector so if he draws into the race it would just add even more speed into the mix and one more thing to just take note of about this pace projector is those two deep closers listed on the bottom of the screen the number four golden glider and the number five god of love they're just shown too far back that they're kind of off the screen in the graphic that we're displaying because there are so many runners ahead of them who want to be forwardly placed in this race Let's start by taking a look at that morning line favorite, the number three Classic Causeway. Let's take a look at that race when Classic Causeway broke his name at Saratoga. Going off at 13 to one on this day, he was a little bit of a secret, even though he came into this race with some fast workouts for Brian Lynch, but he busted out of the gate from an inside post position, secured the early lead and just widened through the stretch to win by over six lengths, going this demanding seven furlong distance. This has proven to be a strong race as the runner up Trafalgar has come back to do some nice things in subsequent starts. And Classic Causeway, well, you could say that he's been a little bit disappointing in his two races after this because he did lose twice as the favorite in graded stakes races, he did find himself in some tough spots and some difficult circumstances because he drew that outside number 13 post position of 13 runners in the grade one breeders futurity back in October, had to be rushed up to take the lead that day and faded a bit in the late stages. I think you can forgive him for that effort. And then last time out, they tried to experiment with rating tactics. I wonder in retrospect if that was the wrong move in the Kentucky Jockey Club because you see those blue color coded pace figures early in the race. That pace does just did not heat up as much as it looked like it was going to on paper and Joel Rosario reserved this horse about two to three lengths off the pace and nearly going and it's not like it totally fell apart that day so I thought Classic Causeway actually ran pretty well to be second to Smile Happy who might be the most highly regarded three-year-old coming into this season out there he'll be making his three-year-old debut in the Risen Star next week uh, but Classic Causeway he definitely is one that is coming off some decent performances and if he can get back to that 112 time from US speed figure that he ran in his debut he is certainly dangerous here and I think he is the horse to beat in a wide open Sam F. Davis. 
Moving on to another horse that could take some money in this race. That is the number seven, Make It Big. He's coming into this graded stakes debut undefeated, having gone three for three through his career, and he's coming off a stakes victory in the Springboard Mile. Let's take a look at that race from Remington Park back in September, and he just grinds it out to get the job done this day. That's him in the blinkers coming into the stretch three wide, ranging up outside of that chestnut horse Osborne in between horses, and these two are going to sort of duke it out to the wire. The runner-up is pretty game in inside of them make it big still looks a little bit green on the outside he's kind of idling a bit once he gets to that horse and does eventually forge past him to win this race by a half length visually it was not the most impressive effort but he does get the job done and he did improve his time formula speed figure all the way up to a 97 now he's gonna have to run even faster to take down this field because most of these horses are running speed figures in the low 100s they've broken out into the triple digit time formula speed figure so make it big is going to have to produce the kind of number that he hasn't yet before but he did have some decent races prior to that. The horse that he beat two back at Gulfstream, Lightning Larry, has come back to do some nice things since then and improve his speed figure. So maybe those early races are a little bit better than Time Form US has them rated. That said, it does feel like Make It Big is one of these horses that is going to take money in this race with Jose Ortiz keeping the mount. Both of the mounts of the Ortiz Brothers Classic Causeway and Make It Big figure to be the first two choices in the wagering. And I just think this is a way more wide open race than that. So I wanted to do some value shopping and find a bigger price to highlight. Another horse that I think could take some money in this race that you probably want to do have an opinion about is the number eight, Shipsational, a New York bred who's stepping out into open company for the first time. And let's take a look at his most recent stakes victory from back at the end of October in the Sleepy Hollow. And Shipsational, he does handle a sloppy track on this day. As you can see, the track was very wet uh, on this card at Belmont Park. And that's him, the chestnut with the white noseband coming through the stretch here in the lead. He's going to take a challenge in the late stages from that horse who's getting off the rail right behind him the four to five favorite on this day overtook overstep i should say and that horse does get to him in the late stages but i do think that ship stational digs in right here as they come to the wire to fend that horse off and i like the gameness that ship stational has shown in his races he's not the biggest horse you could see in that replay he's a little bit lightly made uh but he's got a nice stride on him he really lowers his head and tries hard the question with ship stational is why did he regress so much from a speed figure standpoint last time? Was it just the sloppy track? Was it the slow pace that was holding down the final time of that number? Because you do see those blue color coded pace figures for the Sleepy Hollow. Uh, because Ship Stational had shown in his prior race back in the Bertram F. Bond Guard in late September that he could run a faster speed figure, getting a 108 that day, beating a very nice New York bred in Senbei. However, that was going seven furlongs. He did take that step backwards, going a mile last time when he just barely got the job done at six to five. Uh, he's now stretching out to go two turns for the first time. These are not connections. The locally, the New York-based uh, trainer, Ed Barker, that typically does a lot of shipping to other circuits. So I think that's a bit of a question mark as well. Just think there are a lot of unknowns about Shipsational. I do feel like coming off those two victories, he is a horse that could take some money in this race. So he's one that I kind of wanted to take a slightly negative view of. Mark Cassie has three runners entered in this race. I'm going to talk about two of them, and I'm most interested in his two runners that are coming in from Woodbine. Let's begin with Golden Glider, the number four, and take a look at his last out victory at the Bay Downs. Now, I mentioned he came in from Woodbine. Well, he did so in this race as he had made his career debut at Woodbine and done so very impressively, winning that race from last to first. And he basically does the same thing in this Tampa Bay allowance race, but showed that he could at least handle dirt after winning that debut on the Tapita surface up at Woodbine. This performance not quite as visually impressive as the one that he put out in his debut, obviously coming from last to first in this race. He just had to pass four rivals as it was only a five-horse field. Uh, but he did make a sweeping move around the far turn to take over at the top of the stretch. What I didn't like is that he really didn't shut the door on the field after that. He kind of idled a bit once he made the front end, was uh, not exactly pricking his ears or anything, not giving any signs that he was green per se, but he just didn't put that field away the way that you'd want to see a horse like him do, given that he was the four to five favorite, his main rival that he was supposed to face that day, Emmanuel, a Todd Pletcher trained runner that's highly tattered. He scratched out of that race. So Golden Glider just really laid over that field. And it should be noted, a few of the horses that finished directly behind him, including the runner on Boitano, did come back in a maiden special in a, uh, allowance race a few weeks later and face off against that highly regarded Todd Pletcher runner, Emmanuel. 
and Emmanuel beat them by over 10 lengths. All of these horses that faced off against Golden Glider came back in that subsequent allowance race and lost by double digit margin. So I'm not sure that that's a real vote of confidence in the quality of the race that Golden Glider comes out of. And you also see those blue color coded race rating boxes indicating that perhaps those two tracks that he ran over at both Tampa and Woodbine in his debut did favor his closing running style. So just some reasons to be a little bit suspect of Golden Glider. But the one positive thing about this horse is that he's going to get plenty, plenty of pace to close into here. And Mark Cassie has had some success in these races before. So I do think he's a horse that you don't want to totally dismiss, even though he has some things to prove. I am more interested in another Mark Cassie trained runner, the number five, God of Love. And let's take a look at his last out stakes victories from Woodbine in the grade three gray stakes back at the end of November. That is him in the pink silks and the white face moving up on the outside here. And I like the way that he just kind of grinds this field down through the stretch. He came wide into the stretch, uh, comes with a nice late rally to get past some pretty good horses here. The runner-up Ironstone had run some big speed figures in his prior races, and God of Love wins this race going away at the end. While he has had most of his success so far on synthetic and turf, with both those victories coming on those two other surfaces, I'm somewhat optimistic about him getting on the dirt here because his pedigree says that he really should be able to handle anything. His sire Cupid has shown a great deal of versatility among his progeny so far. They've really run on anything. So I think that's a good sign with God of Love. I like that he over came a slow pace to win that race last time. You see those blue color coded time form US speed pace figures in the PPs and that big upgrade that he got for closing into that slow pace is resulted or shown in the 106 time form US speed figure that he got for that gray stakes victory. That 106 number puts him right in the mix among the favorites here. So I think uh, that God of Love is interesting for that reason. And also I found a DRF formulator fact that's pretty interesting for Marcassi that applies to this horse synthetic to dirt with horses that won their last races over the past five years. Mark Cassie is eight for 30, a strong 27% win rate with a really nice $3.67 ROI. And I think that applies really well to this horse because typically horses that win their last starts are moving up in class. So when Mark Cassie gets these horses coming out of Woodbine, typically that's where he most often runs on synthetic surfaces and tries a dirt track, usually in North America, or I should say in the United States coming down South. Uh, these horses run pretty well and they do so at big prices. And I do think that God of Love is going to be a generous price in this race. He's listed at 10 to 1 on the morning line. Like I said at the top, there are a lot of other horses I could talk about. I'll just highlight one more before going to my picks, and that is the number six trademark. This is a horse that is coming in from Kentucky for trainer Victoria Oliver, and I thought he ran really well since stretching out in distance in his last two starts at Churchill Downs, both going this mile and 16th trip that he will tackle at Tampa Bay Downs on Saturday. He improved to break his bait and two back. I like the way that he finished that race, and he earned a strong 105 time from USB figure for that performance. If you look through the field, those that finished behind him that number completely checks out horses that ran behind him have come back to validate that speed figure in subsequent starts and then last and out while the speed figure did dip a little bit again i like the finish that he showed going this distance to beat allowance company at churchill back at the end of november i believe that was the same day that they contested the kentucky jockey club and while he ran a little bit slower than that race i thought he still finished well to win and beat a decent field again some horses that have come back to run similar or higher speed figures in subsequent starts so i like the way the trademark is coming into this and you might recall his trainer, Victoria Oliver, had a nice Tampa Bay Downs three-year-old last year as she sent out Hidden Stash to, I believe, finish second in this race at 8-1 to one last year. So perhaps Trademark can recreate some of that magic as he tries to pull off a similar feat or perhaps go one better in the Sam F. Davis in 2022. So let's throw my picks for this race, and I'm going to try to highlight some of those long shots that I was just talking about. I did put one of those Mark Cassie trained runners, the number five God of Love on top. I like that formulator fact that I found, and I was impressed visually with this horse's last victory in the gray stakes. And I'm hopeful that he can transfer that synthetic form to the dirt because he's going to get, or he's supposed to get, I should say, plenty of pace to close into here if the field holds together as is. I've got that warning line favorite classic causeway in second. And really not a lot of knocks against him other than the price that he's going to be the favorite in this very competitive field. And I do have that number six trademark who's listed at 15 to one in the morning line in third. I think he's an improving runner that can get a big piece of this coming in from Kentucky. So that's a look at the grade three Sam F. Davis at Tampa Bay Downs on Saturday. Thanks to Gainsway for presenting this video and all of our Derby Prep coverage in 2022. And good luck to you if you're playing this weekend.